In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mother, we give and consecrate this time to you, to your Immaculate Heart, on this Holy Saturday as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Teresa of Avila, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Feel free to um, get up and get more food as you like during the talk. There's no, uh, I mean, it's not like there's no rules, but, you know, like, so you can be flexible, okay? Especially if you want to put money in the donation jar. You can get up any time for that. Um, all right, last week we talked about the idea of salvation, the idea of heaven and hell. As such, we talked about the um, the church's uh, continual teaching about the reality of hell and the existence of hell, not as simply like a theoretical possibility, but as an actually existing thing. Um, and we talked about uh, the, the reasonableness of a position like that, because it, it's kind of the practical corollary of two things. The first being the reality that you and I have an immortal soul that doesn't perish after death, and the reality that you and I are, are truly free persons who are capable of turning ourselves towards God, are capable of turning ourselves away from God. So the fact that you and I are actually free uh, and the fact that we have an immortal soul logically um, uh, lends itself to the, to the concrete belief of the reality of hell. So we talked a little bit about that last time. And today we're going we're gonna to talk about what salvation looks like for Catholics. So... This is a talk about salvation um, for Catholics, which is presumably everybody here. If you're not, you're super welcome. Um, first, here are a set of principles that I think ground the question. This is obviously a massive question, you know, and so we're we're going to just look at it from a specific angle. We'll keep the same. Also, sorry, we'll keep the same ground rules kind of as we had last time, which was if you have a clarifying question, something that wasn't clear that I said, which is not unlikely, go ahead and raise your hand, and I can try and clarify it. And then at the end of the talk, if there are more uh, kind of speculative questions, what you might call Dan Gannon questions, we can ask those at the end. <laughs> okay, so the first principle. The first principle is salvation is a gift, all right? Salvation is a gift. That's the totally radical foundational principle for uh, what we believe as Catholics, that the possibility of entrance into heaven is, is fundamentally a gift that God gives to you and I. So the, the necessary corollary to that, or to say the same thing in a slightly different way, is to say that you and I are incapable of earning heaven. Right? It's too big for us to earn. And this is something I've, I've talked a little bit about before. Um, but it's, that's actually really, really good news. It's really good news that heaven is bigger than you and I can earn. Because it means it gives us something that transcends our natural capabilities. It gives us something that's greater than you and I can accomplish on our own help, on our, on our own effort. Uh, and that's really good news, because it means like the possibility for happiness is, is categorically or infinitely greater than you and I can accomplish just based on like our own effort of trying and working hard. So that's really good news. Uh, it's also really humbling news because it means that you and I are utterly incapable of moving ourselves on our own without the help of God's grace to heaven. Right? So on the one hand, it's really beautiful and exciting and delightful, uh, extraordinary. On the other hand, uh, it's, it's humble because uh, it shows our littleness and our finitude. All right. To say salvation is fundamentally and essentially a gift is to necessarily then offer a corrective for a very far-reaching and rather pernicious heresy called Pelagianism, which you might have heard of before. You've probably heard of St. Augustine, right? St. Saint, Saint Augustine was 4th century um, doctor of the church, uh, born in northern Africa, did amazing things. One of his big theological opponents, so to speak, was this priest named Pelagius, who posited the theory that you and I can get ourselves to heaven without the aid of grace. Okay? That was a really big theory that Pelagius put forward and that St. Augustine uh, forcefully defended against. 
The idea of Pelagianism, although condemned definitively by the church, I think is very attractive to a lot of people because it appeals to the the like the hardcore macho I can do it I'm strong enough let me get at it I I'm going to I'm going to pull myself up by the bootstraps I'm going to get myself to heaven I'm going to work really hard and it's all about me if I just if I just try hard enough I can get there There's something appealing to that there's also like a truth in it right but if you absolutize it then um uh, you you paradoxically limit yourself to the to what you're able to receive because you and I are not strong enough to get ourselves to heaven. Okay, this is kind of a side note, but perhaps it will be interesting to some of you. It's something that I found in my own experience growing up. I had a lot of really wonderful and well-intentioned and well-meaning um, Protestant friends, and so we had conversations about uh, different I, different aspects of of Christianity, different aspects of Protestantism and Catholicism. And I noticed that a lot of them were accusing Catholics of being Pelagians, although they didn't use those words. Like they basically said, because in the faith and works dichotomy, they were basically saying, well, you Catholics like don't believe in faith. You just believe in works. You just think that your works are capable of getting to heaven. But as Protestants, we actually like follow the scripture and say that faith is capable of getting us to heaven. Okay, so it's... It's like, okay, I see what they're going with. And actually, I kind of believed what they said about Catholicism. It was like, oh, yeah, I guess we are just kind of working hard. And then I was like, wait, but that's not what the Bible says, actually. So I, I got confused. So don't get confused like I got confused when I was 17 and talking with my dear Protestant friends. Okay. But uh, you might have picked up on that. Like some people will like accuse Catholics of just saying, well, you guys focus on work so much to the exclusion of faith, and you just think you guys can work yourselves to heaven. It's like, wait a second. That's a, that's a heresy called Pelagianism. That's not actually what Catholics believe. All right. Maybe you haven't had those conversations. Maybe some of you have. But uh, anyways, that, that, those ideas are in the water, at least with respect to, to dialogues between different, uh, between like Protestants and Catholics. Okay, another, um, another principle is called, well, this is not really like a formal principle. It's just a logical truth. Uh, salvation is not guaranteed because one is Catholic. Right. That's where if some people some people got this idea like, OK, I'm Catholic and therefore I can kick my feet up and I don't have to do anything because, like, you know, I'm going to heaven. It's like, I don't know, man. I don't know where you read that. <laughs> like, that's not what we believe. Right. So so salvation is not something that automatically comes to you and I simply by the fact of belonging to the church. Um, so contrary wise, salvation is not denied um, by the simple fact of someone not being Catholic. Right, so that's the topic of next week. That's what we're going to talk about all next week, which is probably like the more hot button idea. Like, well, what does salvation really look like for people who aren't Catholic? That's next week. Okay, so that's another principle: salvation just because you're Catholic isn't guaranteed. But here's a here's a correlating idea or a correlating principle: salvation is much more easily ascertained by those who are Catholic. Right. So, like the sacramental order that you and I are given, namely like the ability to, to receive baptism, confirmation, confession, first communion, and holy communion, to receive the anointing of the sick, to receive the sacrament of marriage, to be finally professed if you're religious, to receive the, the grace of ordination if you're a priest. Like all of these um, sacraments, well, final profession isn't a sacrament, but okay, all of the seven sacraments uh, are efficacious means of grace that move us like definitively closer to heaven, right? So, so they are the super highway to heaven. Actually, Blessed Carlos Acuti, 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 how do you say it? Acutis? So he has this really cool phrase that says the Eucharist. So he's this like one of the newer blessings in the church, right? 15 year old Italian British guy who died uh, in the early 2000s. And he has this phrase that says, the Eucharist is the superhighway to heaven, which I like. Oh, that's pretty cool. The Eucharist is the superhighway to heaven. Right? So that's getting at this idea, that the sacraments are the ordinary means of salvation that God has given through the church, which means they're like the most straightforward, the most direct, the most uh, yeah, authentic and effective means of salvation. Um, that's true. That's true on like the order of nature on like an ontological level, like on the order of who we are as individual persons, they actually move us there, like in and who we are as, as individual persons. But it, that's also true like on 
on the level of our knowledge and the level of our certainty through faith. Because like we can see the sacraments, we can touch them, we can feel them. We have confidence that something's actually happening to us even when nothing's going on inside, like we, in terms of feeling. Like, you know, I received the Eucharist and I was like, well, Jesus, I believe that this was that this was meritorious for my salvation. I hope it was meritorious for my salvation. I pray, I, you know, I make acts of reverence and devotion to you in the Blessed Sacrament, but also like, you know, I'm totally distracted about, you know, 500 other things. And it's like, I'm not feeling like, you know, I'm in ecstasy or whatever. It's like, okay, that's a pretty common experience in the human condition, especially for Catholics who are striving to live their faith. But because we believe that uh, there's actual grace that's given to you and I in and through the sacramental order, like we have confidence that we're actually moving closer to Christ, even though on the inside it's like, "Ah, I'm not really feeling much. Okay? So, like, that's something that the sacraments give us on the level of our knowledge, on the level of our knowledge and faith, we have confidence that through the reception of the sacraments, through the worship of God and Holy Mass, through the forgiveness of sins and confession, like we're actually growing closer to Jesus. Okay. So, that is... Um, well, let me, let, me have, let me give kind of one more... Um, one more principle... One, the one more principle is um, justification and merit. So this is the doctrine that's kind of codified in the Council of Trent uh, that, that uh, is sort of the definitive response to Martin Luther's objections to the church. So the doctrine of justification says, uh, you and I, through an unmerited gift of our own, receive the grace of justification, uh, like through baptism, or receive it anew um, in the grace of confession if it was lost through mortal sin. And the grace of justification is basically um, being in a real and living relationship of love with Jesus Christ. That's basically what that means. So you and I, insofar as we're in the state of grace, have, have, the, st- have the, the grace of justification, which is, those are kind of technical terms, to mean we're in a relationship of friendship with Jesus Christ that's based on charity. Okay, a relationship of Jesus Christ or a friendship with Jesus Christ that's based on love. Because friendships can be based on different things, right? You can be friends with someone because you just kind of enjoy hanging out in their pleasure, in their company, and they make you laugh. But you can you can be friends with somebody because uh, you know they offer you some kind of service that's helpful. So it's like, oh yeah, I like hanging out with this guy because he helps me do my math homework, right? Do you really love him? Well, I love him in view of what he gives me, which is knowledge so I can pass my math test. But do I really love him? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> you know. But then you can have friends that's based real, on like real friends, on real love, right? on real charity. And that's the highest form of friendship. Okay. That's the kind of friendship that you and I enter into in the grace of justification or in a state of grace or in the sanctifying grace. Those are all effective synonyms. So, so when you hear the terms of like sanctifying grace or the grace of justification, um, that what that's getting at is that you and I are in a, a, a friendship with the person of Jesus Christ that's based on charity. Okay. Now, your own experience probably manifests that friendships that are based on charity are not static things, but can also grow. Right? When you're friends with somebody that's based on a mutual benevolence, on a mutual self-willing of, of the good of the other, like, I want you to succeed, I want you to flourish, to be excellent, you want me to flourish and to be excellent. I love you with a real love. You love me with a real love. That's not a static friendship, right? That friendship can grow and develop and deepen over time. So too on the supernatural plane. When you and I are in a relationship of charity with the person of Jesus, that relationship isn't static, but it can grow and develop and deepen throughout time. Make sense? Okay. When that relationship grows and deepens, uh, and blossoms throughout time in the order of charity, it's, that's called merit. So merit's a super technical term uh, in the Catholic theological tradition. When you see someone is meriting salvation, what that means is they're already in a relationship of love, and then the deep and abiding love of Jesus present within that person allows, uh, uh, like, becomes, becomes a, a real living part of that person that simultaneously allows that person to work through his or her own authentic humanity to grow in a relationship of, Je- a relationship of love with Jesus. Okay? So merit is something that happens after justification or after sanctifying grace or after being in a relationship of love with Jesus. And then we merit a deeper and deeper friendship through that love of Jesus dwelling within us. 
Okay. So, yeah, that's really beautiful. It's kind of technical, but it's also really beautiful and helpful to um, uh, understand and try and live in in the ordinariness of our daily life. Are you saying that we merit salvation but don't earn it? Um, we we merit a greater participation in the divine like life of God. So you're you're familiar with the image. You're familiar with the image of the person in heaven who is like totally satisfied because they're completely filled with the love of God. And you imagine that love of God is like a thimble, you know, and that's like you and me. And then you have like the Teresa of Avila who has, you know, this massive stein and like her stein is completely filled with water and she's totally full of the love of God, right? So it's like there are different quantities of, of, of divine charity that fill their cups, but they're both totally full. So you and I have the capability of responding to the grace that Jesus gives us to enlarge, so to speak, our cup, our capacity to receive divine charity. So salvation is given to you and me as an unmerited, as a gratuitous or a free gift. And then you and I have the ability to respond to the living love of Jesus present in our hearts, to grow our hearts, to enlarge our hearts, to be able to receive more divine love. Does that that make sense? Yeah. So it's slightly different uh, because, but yeah, 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 yeah. I think that was clear enough. So that's why, like, it's so cool and beautiful and fitting. Like, it just makes sense to try and love God as much as we can. Even if it's like, you know, well, I'm living a good life. I believe through the mercy of God, like, I'll, go, I'll die and go to heaven. It's like, okay, beautiful. But, like, heaven speaks the language of charity, the language of divine love, which is a maximal language. So it's like, why would I not strive to give myself more and more and more and love more and more and have my heart expand more and more and more? Because, like, all I'm doing is making myself more radically receptive to the love of God. It's like, you know, why not? <laughs> why not, you know? That's the idea. That's the idea of love. Okay. So that's, that's like a just sort of, um, yeah, sketch. Obviously, there's a lot more you can say about salvation uh, in a positive sense, how salvation is offered to you and I as believers, as uh, members of the mystical body of Christ, but uh, we'll move on to the negative side, which is how salvation is lost by you and I. The really simple answer is that salvation is lost through mortal sin, right? That's the simple theological um, description. Uh, it's been a truth that's reiterated throughout the history of the church again and again and again and again. So this is a cool book. If anybody wants to like dive deep into the doctrine of the church, this is informally called the Denzinger, formally called the Compendium of Creeds, Definitions, and Declarations on Matters of Faith and Morals. So this guy in like the 19th century realized that there was no one source that somebody could have recourse to to learn like where all of the definitive statements and teachings of the Catholic Church were. So he was like, let's make it. And this is what it is. So all of, you're wondering, like, all, all of the councils, all of the definitions of the popes, all of the anathemas at the end of ecumenical councils, all of those things, right here. It's all right here. And when I was looking up the idea of mortal sin, there were, like, there were like 40 different references to mortal sin. So it's, like, it's a consistent teaching within the whole history of the church. It's not a novel idea. I mean, it derives from Scripture itself. When James says there are some sins that are deadly, there are some sins that are not deadly, right? So it's in the Scriptures itself. It also is verified, I think, in our experience, too, that there are some things, there are some actions that you and I can do that can kill, um, like, a friendship with another person. Okay. Consequently, a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about um, is from... Is from the Denzinger. And then another reference I have is, of course, the Catechism. The Catechism, by the way, references the Denzinger all the time. Like most of the sources of the Catechism are coming from the Denzinger. And then the other one is John Paul II's amazing encyclical, Veritatis Splendor, which is the splendor of truth. Guess what? This also references the Denzinger. <laughs> okay. So some of this is probably 
uh, not new information about mortal sin, but we'll just we'll just run through it, and then we'll see where we go. Mortal sin is contrasted with venial sin. Venial sin are sins that um, damage the relationship that we have with Jesus, uh, but they're not sins that uh, definitively uh, rupture or kill that relationship with Jesus. Here are the the consequences or the effects of mortal sin as laid out by the doctrine of the church. The first is enmity with God, which is a kind of hatred of God, or or like a definitive rupture in the relationship with God. The second is the loss of the grace of justification. So that's what I was talking about when I was talking about justification. So that's divine charity, divine friendship. So the loss of the grace of justification. Exclusion um, from the kingdom of God. Delivery into the power of the devil and eternal damnation. So this is the; these are all definitions from the church, and there's lots of different references for each of these little uh, uh, consequences. So you'll note that it's kind of saying the same thing from different perspectives. Like if it says exclusion from the kingdom of God and eternal damnation, those are logically saying the same thing, but just from different perspectives, right? And so similarly, what if it's saying like enmity with God and the loss of the grace of justification, those are kind of saying like the same thing, but they're just emphasizing it differently. What may be of, of interest, uh, and it might be known to some of you already, is that mortal sin opens up the soul to uh, the, the power of the devil, basically. So persons who like are afflicted by oppressive uh, like demonic spirits or demonic possession and things, almost all the time, uh, those persons somehow like op- open themselves up to demonic activity through, um, or at least in conjunction with mortal sins. So it's sort of just like taking down all of your defenses, because you and I are safe um, in the heart of Jesus. Okay, uh, mortal sin. Let's see. I can... So just to give, uh, here's an image of mortal sin, or the definition, rather, of mortal sin that's helpful. The first is, and you know this probably, grave matter, full knowledge, and deliberate consent. So to commit a mortal sin, the thing itself, the object of the action, has to be grave matter, which is to say it has to be something that's wrong in itself in a, in a, in a serious degree. So it's not just like taking a piece of paper from... Uh, it's not just like it's not just like taking a donut, you know, from you know this wonderful spread and not and not giving a donation, right? Not a mortal sin, okay? <laughs> not, not a mortal sin, <laughs> right? It's little, right? Let's let's you know, don't sweat it, don't sweat it. Um, okay, so so yeah, the thing itself, the thing itself has to be really has to be really bad, um, and then and then you have to know that it's really bad, so you have to have full knowledge. And then you have to have uh, deliberate consent. We're going to come back to these in a second because they're um, they're important and they're clarifying in the very words themselves. Um, another image that I like for mortal sin is kind of taken from St. Thomas, and it's more like relational. So it's sort of like you and I, you and I are moving steadily towards God. We're in a relationship with God. And so when we try to live a virtuous life, a loving life, a forgiving and a merciful life, a life that worships God, you know, following the commandments, it's like we're moving ourselves in something, in something of a straight ish line towards God. And then venial sin is kind of like, well, I, I veered off a little bit, but then I came back on, or I tripped, you know, but I'm still kind of moving forward. It's like I'm going in the general right direction. You know, I made a little bit of a wrong turn here, so I'm not quite oriented towards my end, but eventually I sort of steer myself back. Okay? This is what venial sins do. Mortal sin is like I'm trying to go towards God, and I, I do a 180. I'm like, I'm not even facing God anymore. I totally stop. Or it's like I'm driving in a car, and I'm, I do mortal sin, and it's like, you know, I I pour sand in my gasoline. It's like, whoop, that, we're not moving forward anymore, right? I just totally wrecked the means by which I was moving myself forward, okay? So that's another image of mortal sin that's, uh, it's helpful for me when thinking about it, because sometimes it's easy to get lost in the minutia of, like, full, full, uh, full knowledge and deliberate consent and things like that. All right, here is something pertinent to this particular moment in the life of the church. 
and has been for like the past like 40 or 50 years. There are some people, so maybe you've, maybe you've like smelt this like in conversations with other people. You've just sort of picked up on this. Some people either deny um, the, the validity of mortal sin, like they deny that, that this is a helpful thing to talk about, um, and so they'll, they'll just be like, I know the church clearly taught all of those things, but we don't really need to have like a definitive or continuous set of church teachings, and so we can just sort of say, cut, we're starting over, and we're gonna do, we're gonna teach things that conform more to like the spirit of the age. You know, we're gonna be really like um, contemporary and speak the same language that the people are speaking, and while kind of rejecting and forgetting about the need to have any kind of historical continuity with respect to truth. So there's some people who are really advocating for that. Part of them, if you guys were here last week, are doing so by having a vague recourse to this Kantian critique of metaphysics, right? Where they're saying the things that we say don't actually line up to reality in itself. And so it's like, yeah, I know the church taught these things, but all of these truths, you know, like the truth of Jesus being fully God and fully man, uh, those are like, those are time-bound ideas that don't have a universal extensivity. So it's like basically the appeal to saying every truth claim you can ever make is perspectival, is dependent upon your perspective. You can never make a truth claim that is, that is true for all time and all places. And therefore, all of the doctrine of the church that was painstakingly developed for the last 2,000 years is a time-bound, contingent truth that doesn't actually extend through all time and place. Okay, if, like that's heresy, okay? Don't believe it. That's totally wrong and it'll get people into a lot of trouble. It also ultimately undermines any kind of authentic capacity to be able to have a conversation about something that's true at all, right? It's just like, it's a, it's a really sneaky form of relativism, all right? And some people can slide into this in um, very subtle ways. So that's not true, okay? Not true, not true. But some people think it, some people believe it, and some people then apply it to the idea of mortal sin. Specifically, they apply it to um, the idea of intrinsically evil actions, right? Because intrinsically evil actions is saying this specific act is wrong in all times and all places, right? It's a universal truth claim. Okay. Um, yeah, so some people deny, um, some people deny this. Some people deny the validity of moral sin. The positive theory that they put forward is this fancy theory called fundamental option theory. Um, fundamental op so that's the negative, all right? This is the negative proposition that some people put forward, saying um, the distinction between mortal and venial sin isn't really valid. Um, don't worry about it. It's not something like, that was a time-sensitive time thing. Uh, forget it, you know? Then other people put forward this theory, this positive theory, so to speak, called fundamental option theory which came out of, Karl Rahner didn't really like posit it himself, but people took his ideas, Karl Rahner was a theologian in the 1980s, people took, or in the 70s and 80s, people took his ideas and then developed them further into this idea called fundamental option theory. That idea says, you and I, as human beings, are so radically oriented towards God, um, it would take an effectively impossible act of the will to be able to turn ourselves away definitively from God. It's like you and I, you and I are a magnet that's drawn towards God in such a in such a intense and overwhelmingly powerful and strong way that there's nothing that we can do that can take our will away from God. It's like sure we can, you know, like do horrible things. You can get addicted to heroin. You can go and like rob a bank. You can go whatever. Think of any horrible thing you can do. It's like yeah, but you're 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 fundamentally so oriented towards God that it's like basically impossible to turn yourself away from Him. You can in theory. You can in theory do it, but like it takes something that's like beyond your conscious capacity to be able to turn away from God. Okay, our dear friend John Paul II wrote this encyclical in part to condemn this position, okay? So one of the amazing things about this encyclical is the way in which it responds in a very clear and forceful way to the idea of fundamental option theory. Have you guys heard of that, like this, this idea, or have you smelt it? This idea that like someone can be drawn to heaven and like base, so there, here's, the, here's a way that it might get translated today. 
Everybody's basically going to heaven if you're a generally good person. Right? <laughs> if you're a generally good person, then you're going to go to heaven. That's the, that's the, that's the translation of this idea. And you see, so you see how it's the translation, right? The theory, in a, in a high theological sense, says there's something fundamentally uh, theological about the human person that is drawing him beyond like his conscious awareness towards God in a definitive and in a, in a, in a certain way. Here's the really fun term. This is Rahner's term. Each person is, has a supernatural ex, existential dynamic of grace. That's like, the, that's like the super fancy theological term. So this is just to say there's really like high level theological ideas here that trickle down in super, super practical ways. So like that formal term says the human person is effectively constituted in grace. Like what it is to be a human person is to be constituted in a relationship of divine charity with God. That's so like what the. Does that, mean? Does that, mean? Does that, mean? Does that were the case? That is exactly true. Okay. So Donald, uh, Donovan, uh, that's why I created Mr. Wilson. Sorry. <laughs> so Donovan astutely mentioned that the corollary of that idea is that you wouldn't really need sacraments because everybody is already constituted in a divine friendship with God. That's on the level of the definition of their being, right? So. So that's the exact corollary to that position. Exactly. You don't need the sacraments, you don't need the church. And if someone's already constituted on the level of their being in, in a relationship of charity with God, like you don't really need evangelization. Right? It's like everybody's already got it. So this is where you get into uh, Rahner's famous theory of the anonymous Christian. You've heard of that idea. So everybody's anonymously Christian because they're co-constituted on the level of their being in a relationship, in a, in a graced, in a graced state, right? And there's so much sin in the world. Huh? And there's so much sin in the world. Yeah, but sin, but sin, according to this theory, layers on top of the more fundamental reality of being in a graced state uh, of charity with God. Look, I don't think it's true. I'm just saying that like it's a quasi-impenetrable theory once you accept it. Because it says on the deep, on the deepest level of your being, you're 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 in a state of grace, as like a, as like almost a natural idea. Yeah. In in practice, this in practice this theory doesn't really account, I think, helpfully or authentically enough for your freedom. In theory, in theory, it accounts for it. Like in theory, it says, oh no, somebody in theory could make a fundamental option away from God, but like in practice, they never give a specific answer of like when that might be. You know, so popularly, we could think of like the super bad people in the 20th century, and we could say, this person did it, this person did it, that person did it, but uh, nobody's really like practically making those claims. Certainly, no one is making them on a wide scale level. Um, what, what is Roger Fitch's theory on? Um, Rahner's trying to develop uh, he's trying to develop like a, 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 a theological vision of the human person in a way that accounts for like the rich diversity of cultures and the, the novel development of psychologies and different sciences and uh, and he's trying to do so in a way that like accounts for the fundamental claims of Christianity while also trying to like um, uh, be in be in a deep and profound dialogue with the with Christ, with other Christian and non-Christian societies. Yeah. So one of the best descriptions I heard of Rahner from someone who knew him way better than I was is that 90% of the time he asked the right questions and 10% of the time he gave the right answers. Yeah, yeah. So like, like he's motivated. Personally, he was a really devout guy. I don't want to just like, you know, critique Rahner. But personally, he was a really devout guy um, and was, trying to, was really trying to answer the very pertinent uh, and timely questions of the day and, and identify those questions really well. But then the theories that... The theories that he put forward were a little bit too, um, they, were, they, were at, they were at a minimum a little bit too ambiguous. 
such that some people could interpret them in really orthodox ways, and then other people could interpret them in heterodox ways. And so whether or not Rahner is like personally wrong in the, in the things that he said, loads of people took his ideas in very um, heretical ways um, and then based their beliefs off of, off of him. So that's, that's sort of like a charitable way of interpreting Rahner. It's like he probably, or hopefully, didn't, didn't see or intend any of these ideas, but loads of people who followed right after him took those ideas and ran with it. So if you like scholarship, well, no, we'll talk about that next week. OK. Um, so so that's, that's a theory that's really popular, I think, today. It's popular both with respect to the personal call for conversion, right? Because the personal call for conversion loses its chutzpah. It loses its, like, um, intensity when you realize, like, well, probably underneath all of these sins, uh, I'm not really, I'm still, I'm still, like, if somebody asked me, do I want to go to heaven? I'd say yes. So I'm good, right? Because, you know, I'm consciously choosing, yeah, I want to go to heaven. Even if, like, the, the content of all of my actions is, is contradicting that. But if you ask me, yeah, I want to go to heaven. So then I don't actually have to, like, change my life because I'm choosing heaven. Right? It's not a consistent. That's not a consistent view in terms, like, right? You realize that's not like in, integral in terms of the human person. But um, if people have this vague general notion of being impelled towards heaven, then you don't necessarily need to like dig underneath it. So it affects like the personal call to conversion, and it also radically affects uh, the personal call to evangelization. Because like, if that's true for me, that's probably true for um, you know Joe Smith over there, who's not Catholic, right? He's probably also moved in a definitive way towards grace. So, okay. He was Mormon. <laughs> he was Mormon. That's funny. I was thinking of Mormons, but I guess that's why, because Joseph Smith. Um, okay, the church, especially through the person of John Paul, condemns this idea definitively in the encyclical that I mentioned, Veritatis Splendor which is worth reading. I was actually thinking we might read it as like a book club. It's a little bit dry because it's in the cyclical, but it's also really informative. So, um, yeah, so I guess I just gave away my, my preferences <laughs> in terms of reading. I think all encyclicals are dry. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, <laughs> well, I took, this, I took this to a spiritual reading one retreat I did. I made it through like the first 10 pages. I was like... <laughs> But then I went back to it in a class that I read, and it was really good. Okay. So John Paul, in addition to just saying this is false and you shouldn't believe it, um, also says basically his reason for saying it's false is that it doesn't respect uh, human freedom and it doesn't respect the way in which actions of our lives definitively manifest uh, like what we believe, basically. So here's, here's what he said. Uh, this is in Veritatis Splendor 68. He says, It thus needs to be stated that the so-called fundamental option, to the extent that it is distinct from a generic intention, and hence one not yet determined in such a way that freedom is ob obligated, is always brought into play through conscious and free decisions. Precisely for this reason, it is revoked when man engages his freedom in conscious decisions to the contrary with regard to morally grave matter. To separate the fundamental option from concrete kinds of behavior means to contradict the substantial integrity or personal unity of the moral agent in his body and in his soul. Okay, basically what he's saying is it's true that you and I are made for a relationship with God and so we have some kind of natural desire um, for God, but that natural desire or that natural impulse towards something good, what these other people are calling the fundamental option, um, only becomes manifest and specifically becomes manifest on the level of the will in specific and conscious and free actions. And so it's like, it's true in theory, like in terms of who the person is, that we're, that we're drawn in a certain way towards God, but that is either affirmed by our conscious decision to follow what's good, or it's rejected and denied by our conscious decision to follow what's bad. And therefore, you can't use, excuse me, this idea, this, this notion 
um, as something that's universally valid in all of the concrete actions that we do. That's kind of what he was saying in that paragraph that was sort of technical. Okay? All right, so just recognize, I guess the point of this is just to recognize that when, when people vaguely articulate, if they're in the church especially, that they're probably going to heaven anyways, and they, do, and they are, make that articulation regardless of whether or not they believe everything the church believes, whether or not they practice their faith, whether or not they do anything. It's like, it's possible. It's possible for Jesus to save that person. But Jesus also respects the orientation that that person has made for their life. So it's not just like some radical guarantee, you know. Um, and, and it can be helpful to try and like our, uh, appeal to a person's, um, I think ultimately like common sense in this matter. It's like Jesus respects your freedom to be able to um, be in a relationship of love with him and respond to the gifts of grace that he's given to you through his church. And he, so he respects you to do that and he respects you to reject that. So he respects the consequences of those. Um, all right. Um, I think now we'll talk a little bit about conscience. Okay. So we talked, we mentioned there's these three possibilities or these three conditions for a mortal sin. The first is grave matter, which is something that's that's really bad in itself, basically. Uh, and then, then we have full knowledge, and then we have deliberate consent. Okay. So a fundamental option is basically highlighting this idea of deliberate consent and saying it's not really possible. It's not really possible because nothing that we do can change this fundamental orientation towards God. So we talked about that, said that's not true, right? It doesn't really correlate to human experience at all. We can really choose to reject something um, by our actions. Note, by the way, that the, the condition for mortal sin is, is deliberate choice, which is different than like full choice or free choice. It's like I, I remember kind of hearing some ideas. It's like, oh yeah, mortal sin means grave matter, free, full knowledge, and full choice. It's like, well, like a fully free choice. It's like, that's not actually what like the church defines it as. The church defines it as a deliberate choice. And then there's another document again, in our friend here, that, that specifies that, specifies what a deliberate choice is or what a complete consent is. And it says, this, imp a consent con this implies a consent sufficiently deliberate to be a personal choice. Sufficiently deliberate to be a personal choice, right? So you can think of situations where somebody is, is not in a situation that they could make a, a, like a, a deliberate or a personal choice, right? Somebody... I was thinking of it like a clear example of this. If someone goes to a party and then their drink gets spiked and then they do something really stupid. So it's like that person's not to, not like culpable for their for their actions that they did when they were drunk because they didn't choose to it. Someone maliciously acted on them. And okay, so like they're not there. There was clearly not a deliberate. Um, there was clearly not a personal choice that that that, that individual made directly correlating to. Um, the evil that they did, right? But you can think of some. You can think of another option or another example of somebody who's really irate, like super mad, and then does something that's really bad that he regrets immediately. Um, that like anger doesn't excuse um, uh, the the personal choice that that individual made, and. Uh, the, uh, the, this, the catechism actually says this in 1859. It says, feigned ignorance and hardness of heart do not diminish, but rather increase the voluntary character of a sin. Which is interesting and worth noting. Right? Feigned ignorance and hardness of heart do not diminish, but rather increase the voluntary character of sin. So that's from the catechism. Um, so that means like somebody who has received a lot of invitations of grace and then like obstinately said, no, I'm doing it my way. I'm not going to respond to this. I just want to, it's like, I know what the church teaches about, um, about sexual morality, but I don't care and I'm just turning away. It's like, um, that doesn't diminish the person's guilt according to the catechism, but increases the voluntary character of a sin. All right. That's different, by the way, than someone who's, for example, is like addicted in a pattern of sexual sin. So for a person like that, um, there's there's a real like um, 
kind of delicacy with respect to psychological addictions that comes into play in terms of the person's capability of, of deliberately choosing an action. Um, it might not excuse it completely or ultimately, but it's definitely something that comes into play. Similar, similar like tragic situations you could think of is like a young woman who finds herself in an unexpected pregnancy and is pressured by her parents or like literally everybody in her life to end the life of her child. It's like the psychological state that she's in is probably so radically like um, fragile or jeopardized at the point to which she's personally culpable for that. It's, it, let's just say it wouldn't be surprising if her personal culpability is really diminished because of the super like fragile psychological state that she's in. Okay. What's important though is to then say it's, it's still an intrinsically evil action and is probably going to have super serious consequences in terms of her like psychological health and development throughout the course of her life. So it's like, while it's probably the case that subjectively she's not personally super culpable for that action, that's not to say that it's not going to have a super, super negative or like, um, you know, consequence on her capacity to develop in a virtuous or in a healthy way. Right? So those are different things. Okay? I think it's, that's exactly what it changes, actually. I think, I think her personal culpability, that's what I mean by guilt, um, could be diminished or increased depending on like her... The fact that she got pregnant is still more extensive. Oh, oh the, yeah, sure, sure. Well, okay, yeah, depending upon the state and depending on the manner in which like, you know, she was impregnated. Like it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's possible that she was taken advantage of, which is obviously another evil added to an evil. Yeah. Huh? That was an a question between sure, 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 sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Specific moral cases are, are hard to judge in, in general, but it's possible to at least derive like principles from them. Um, okay. Let's go to conscience. So that was just a little bit of a description about um, deliberate like choice, right? Uh, with respect to moral sin and the way that that can vary depending on a variety of factors. Um, and here's full knowledge. Full knowledge basically has to do with conscience, right? There's a lot of conversation about conscience today. Um, I'm probably not going to do, I'm almost certainly not going to do justice to this, but, uh, but well, at least, well, at, uh, at least I want to put down this, like these principles for conscience. Uh, we have an obligation to follow our conscience, and we have an obligation to form our conscience. And our conscience is basically our capacity to, uh, to understand what's good and to follow it, and to understand what's evil and to reject it. So the first principle of conscience uh, is, is the, to the statement of to choose good and to avoid evil, to do good and to avoid evil. So that's the first principle of practical reason. Yeah. Wouldn't that be that we're made the image in the uh, likeness of God so we, can, we have the capacity to know intrinsically that which is good and that which is bad? So, so our, the, this first principle of conscience is directly derived from that truth that you're saying, uh, and that's specifically like a dogmatic truth because it's talking about the nature of the human person, and conscience is specifically like an ethical or a moral, a moral faculty, so it's specifically talking about actions, which is why the first principle of practical reason or the first principle of conscience has to do with actions, to choose good or to avoid evil. But the fact that we have the ability to perceive that and to know that is derived from something prior, which is what you're referring to. Okay. The conscience, so that's basically what the conscience is. Um, actually, John Henry Newman has a really cool, I'm going to quote it because I think it's really cool. John Henry Newman has a really great description of uh, what the conscience is. If you like reading, John Henry Newman's a really cool person to read, by the way. St. John Henry Newman. He was an Anglican priest who converted uh, in the 19th century and became a cardinal and a saint in the Catholic Church. 19th century. I say, then, that the supreme being is of a certain character which expressed in human language we call ethical. He has the attributes of justice, truth, wisdom, sanctity, benevolence, and mercy. As eternal characteristics, in his very nature, the very law of his being, identical with himself. And next, he became creator. 
He implanted this law, which is himself, in the intelligence of all his rational creatures. The divine law, then, is the rule of ethical truth, the standard of right and wrong, a sovereign and irreversible absolute authority in the presence of men and angels. The eternal law, St. Augustine says, is the divine will, the divine reason or will of God, commanding, the observance, forbidding the disturbance of the natural order of things. The natural law, says St. Thomas, is an impression of the divine light in us, a participation of the eternal law in the mind of rational creatures. This law, as apprehended in the mind of individual men, is called conscience. And though it may suffer refraction in passing into the intellectual medium of each, it is not therefore so affected as to lose its character of being the divine law, but still has, as such, the prerogative of commanding obedience. He said so much in like those like four sentences, right? Like he said a lot right there. So he said God in himself is the eternal law because God himself is, is what we call like mercy, wisdom, justice, truth. And so like he, he is, like we describe God as being moral, as being ethical. And then God implants that ordered existence in creation. And so we have like things should be good, right? A tree we, we know is good because it achieves its end of sprouting up and falling acorns and reproducing and things like that. And a person we perceive as good by achieving their end of living out reasonably and virtuously and ethically. So this idea of God as the eternal law is implanted in nature as what we call the natural law. And then the natural law is instantiated in each individual mind as what we call conscience. So conscience is kind of like the, participa the personal participation in the natural law, and the natural law is the participation in the eternal law. Okay, and then, so then, so like conscience is coming directly from God, which is why John Henry Newman has this super famous phrase of calling conscience the aboriginal vicar of Christ, which is like a cool phrase. <laughs> All right, so that's the aboriginal vicar of Christ. So like this, the, the original representative of Christ. Uh, on earth is in the conscious, yeah. Is there a way to share that whole quote with all of us? Sure, sure. Uh, next time, I'll print out them and then distribute them. How's that? Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, what Cardinal Newman said was in rational creatures, yes? Correct. So, politicians wouldn't have to. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a subject of intense debate. <laughs> The subject of intense debate. Um, so, so, yeah. Basically, the con if you wanted to like translate it, you'd say the conscience is the the capacity that you and I have to know what's right, and then because we know it's right, it obliges us um, to do what's right. How about talking about how the Get into on that. Totally, totally. That's where we're moving. Good. So, so you and I have an obligation to follow our conscience because our conscience is the part of like our intellect that tells us, hey, that, that basically says like this is this is right, this is good. So if we deny what our conscience is telling us, then we're we're basically abrogating our rationality. We're saying like. If, we, if like our conscience is impelling us to do X, and then we're like, whatever, I'm going to do Y, like we're, we're, we're denying our, our capability of knowing things. Like we're, we're radically diminishing our dignity as individual persons. So you and I are obliged to follow our conscience. That doesn't mean that our conscience is right. That doesn't mean that X is true. X could be wrong, right? But because our conscience is the only way we know how to... Um, it's, it's the means by which we know this is right or this is wrong. We have to follow it.